we will formally open the conference. Uh, Sir David, thank you. Well, thanks, and uh, first of all, uh, welcome to everybody here. It's a it's a sellout, um, and uh, and that's why it's being streamed on the on the bank's YouTube, or one of the the reasons. Um, and I, I find it quite hard to imagine how it was a sellout. I mean, I think a few years ago, to think of something like this being a sellout uh, would have been seen as pretty unimaginable. And uh, anybody who did turn up to the conference would be seen by their colleagues as rather hair-shirted. Um, but we've got people here today from Tasmania, from Norway, Canada, um, the United States, uh, Switzerland, from uh, over large parts of the world, and even from Newport and Pimlico. So welcome to everybody. Um, and I'd, I'd like to thank, though, uh, first a few people, the Bank of England for hosting this so well and with such, um, I'm sure, with such um, aplomb to ONS for arranging it with ESCO. And there, um, after just a year, it's making a huge impact, I think. And that's thanks to Rebecca, Rebecca Riley. So thanks to Rebecca, and I'd like to pay a personal tribute to her. So why, why ESCO and, and why this conference? Why is there this interest in the, in the problems of measurement? I mean, the problems of measurement have, have always been with us. And in thinking about these remarks, I remembered being at LSE in 1971 and having Harry Johnson lecture to me about, and to all of us, about, uh, about among other things, the balance of payments. And he pointed out that if you added up all the, um, the current accounts, surpluses and, and deficits of the world, the Earth was running a a large trade deficit with the moon. Um, and we all laughed, but it was one of those uh, problems that people look squarely in the face and then pass on. And to some extent, uh, we have still been doing that. And uh, it's taken Brexit, really, to get ONS to really focus on our trade performance. And we're still struggling and to work and to identify all the differences between the way that the US sees our position and the way that we see our position with them. And the, it, the differences between us are, are far from fully identified. So even that kind of very basic um, issue is not yet resolved. But the new focus on measurement mostly doesn't come from these old kinds of problems. It comes from new issues. Um, it comes from the challenges that flow from our changing economies. The world that's, that's more global, more dominated by services, uh, that are delivered digitally, where the underlying capital isn't physical, but it's an intangible. And actually, um, if you haven't, I'd recommend you read the book by Jonathan Haskell and Stan Westlake, which is uh, remarkably readable. Um, <laughs> so... so our patterns of, of work have also changed, for example, through the growth of the gig economy and the sharing economy, which gives new problems of measurement. And the way that we're changing our selection of goods and what we buy is changing dramatically and becoming much more complex and nuanced. Financial flows are now huge. And in parenthesis, I'd suggest that it's now... Um, really only now that we're catching up with the effects and the consequences of the ending of exchange controls in the late 70s and early 80s in all sorts of different ways. And the complexity of finan financial instruments has, has also increased and in giving, giving rise to new issues. It's also worth remembering, and this comes up in some of the sessions uh, today and tomorrow, that security of employment in income inequality, gender inequality, uh, intergenerational fairness, and attacks on the relevance of GDP are also adding further dimensions to these. So the challenges that face economic measurement are significant and complex. But while the challenges are formidable, so are the opportunities. New sources of data, often the byproduct of our digital world, raise the prospect of more than more fine-grained and timely information. The technology we now have at our, at our disposal 
means the constraints of the past bind us less. Great av availability of and access to administrative data are a case in point. The new data and technology, of course, require new techniques and tools to be developed, and there will be downsides to the changes as well as gains to be made. We may, for example, sometimes need a trade-off frequency against accuracy. All this is within the remit of ESCO, a product of Sir Giles Bean's review of economic statistics published over two years ago. His report looked at the challenges of measuring modern dynamic economies, recognising that the pace of change has left many national statistical institutes, including ONS, running to keep up. He argued, among other things, that ONS couldn't tackle this by itself. It needed to be more open and collaborative, bringing together experts and academics, both domestically and internationally. And ESCO is one example of this. It is only one example. There are a number of others, but it's a very important one. And it's a collaboration between quite a number of leading institutions and experts in their fields. And they're working on, as you'll see, many of the major problems of economic measurement. But this more open and collaborative way of doing things brings challenges as well. And I, I'd like to finish, really, by, by touching on some of those. And that's how statistics are sometimes portrayed in, in the media and by even experts. I'd have to hasten to say none of the people here present today. Um, statistics are not carved on tablets of stone. And I quite like a quote from no less than Voltaire. Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. All knowledge is conditional, and any statistic represents our best estimate at the time on the evidence available. As new debt methods and data become available, so our understanding of the economy changes, possibly quite markedly, through changing established data series and adding new ones. The economy might be larger or smaller, or its composition might be quite different from what we expected. It would be tempting and easy for people to try to present these changes as correcting, sort of in quotes, errors. Sometimes, of course, there are mistakes, and everyone at ONS is very aware of the risk of those, particularly at a time when ONS is changing dramatically in terms of its methods, its sources, and its technology. So then, at, that, at this stage, I think we'd all say that we're particularly vulnerable to errors, and when there, are that, when there is that kind of mistake or error, we should be quite upfront in acknowledging that it's happened. But changes in measurements that come from changes in methods and sources should lead to improvements. Um, and those are, those, the changes that come from those are not and shouldn't be seen as errors or mistakes. Because if they are described that way, that will inhibit people, and I, here I include both producers and the users of statistics, from pursuing them. It will make us all more risk-averse. It's never going to be a, a comfortable set of changes, and there will, for example, be discontinuities in data series, and we have to think very carefully about those. But we have to be open to those changes with the changes in the economy and the changes in the ways of, of measuring it. So what's, what's our role in that, just, just very finally? I mean, as chair of the UK Statistics Authority, what I give absolute assurance is that um, we will continue to maintain what I think maintain what I think is a very strong structure, legal structure in this country in terms of the independence of our statistical production. Um, but the challenges of communication will be there, and those aren't for today or tomorrow. I mean, today and tomorrow you've got some, I think, some very enticing sessions, but rather technical ones. Our task as the authority is to protect as far as we possibly can the independence of production and to draw those distinctions between errors that arise from uh, simple mistakes and changes that come from changes in methods and sources. And we will play our part in that. But I'd like to ask you to play your part in this. You can help defend and protect 
and advance the cause of statistics yourselves as we go through this difficult and interesting transition. So thank you, and enjoy the conference. come to the podium, I think, because it's probably slightly easier for people. Um, well, I have a very simple um, and delightful task this morning, and that's simply to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, who's really going to get the party started um, in terms of our substantive discussions over the next couple of days. So, Nick Bloom is the William Eberl Professor of Economics at Stanford University. He's the co-director of the Productivity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Programme at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His research focuses on management practices and uncertainty. He's previously worked at the UK Treasury and at McKinsey. He has uh, a list of awards, as long as your arm, from many distinguished bodies. He has degrees from Oxford, Cambridge and London University. But for today, the most important thing is he is a wonderful friend of ONS and a magnificent contributor to the Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence. Um, so I'd like to waste no more time and give the floor to Nick to give our first presentation. OK, I should say, before I go any further, uh, it's like amazingly happy to be here, the fact that ESCO is... Uh, Taken off, as you know, on the, I, I, I'm a, weirdly enough a, by now a dual national. I've been living in America long enough to actually have a U.S. citizenship as well. And their uh, truth and fact are like, you know, disappearing. Uh, what's it called? Fake news. It's like so frustrating in the U.S. So, so it's so refreshing to come over here where there's a. I love that David's comment about you know trying to in the U.S. There's actually been an assault. I don't know if you saw this in the trade statistics. They tried to rewrite the trade statistics to make America's balance of payment look better. So you know things are pretty dark on the other side. So this is you know a shining tower of light. Um, so uh, here we go. So I'm going to talk about uh, measuring business uncertainty at Taylor T. Service. I'm going to talk about Brexit towards the end. I just removed it from the title. I didn't want to over sensationalize what I was going to talk about. But Brexit definitely figures. So, you know, many economists think uncertainty matters. There's a great piece by Stock and Watson. They, uh, they wrote a paper in the Brookings Panel of Economic Affairs in 2012 where they tried to understand why the Great Recession happened. And they did something called vector auto regression, and they tried to analyze the data. And their basic question was, was the Great Recession A, caused by really bad shocks, or B, by the structure of the economy changing. And they came up to the conclusion it was basically just particularly big shocks. It was nothing unusual. It wasn't a new economy. It's just that it was hit by very large shocks. And it talks about those very large shocks being financial and uncertainty shocks. And in fact, they said they're so similar in the data, you can't tell them apart. So the correlation in time series was about 0.85. So economists have claimed potentially uncertainty is a big factor. Uh, there's a lot of coverage in the media. So I should say, when, I, when this went from PowerPoint to PDF, some of, the, uh, some of the animation has disappeared. I didn't mean to show these both at the same time, but uh, underneath there's a thing about Donald Trump, uh, you know, an election I was unfortunately on the wrong side of. Uh, so Donald Trump is generating and continues to generate masses of economic uncertainty, and you know, no needs telling about Brexit still rumbles on. I'll show you some data, at least from firms, it doesn't appear to have got any better. Uh, and policymakers care about it a lot. About I've been doing work on policy uncertainty I'll briefly talk about for the maybe 10 minutes. And about three years ago, due to a kind of strange thing, there's something called the G20, where it meets uh, twice a year, and it's in the control of one country for a year. When the Turks ran it, they wanted to focus on policy uncertainty, I think because of reflecting internal political fighting going on. But anyway, the central bank of Turkey, the governor, Adam, asked me to talk to the G20 central bank governors about policy uncertainty. So I got to talk to... You know, Mark, it was Mark Carney and Janet Yellen and Mario Draghi and all of these characters there. Uh, it went on for 30 minutes, and there was 50 minutes of Q&A, and there was a lot of interest in it. You can see how very much related to monetary policy this was. But being at Stanford, which is famous, so Stanford has the Hoover Institute. Hoover was a Republican president. Stanford's seen as, I mean, you know, I, I'm apolitical, but Stanford's seen as at least more Republican than the average uh, American university. People like John Taylor and John Cochran from... For many of them, the most, you know, the most important evidence that uncertainty is important is 
Paul Krugman thinks it isn't. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's, this, there's, there's a set of people who fantastically define themselves as the exact inverse of whatever Paul Krugman thinks. Now, again, the animation has disappeared, so I was going to show you them one after another, but Paul Krugman has written a lot about uh, uncertainty, and this is one of the more polite titles. And you can see the ones below, they're like the uncertainty scam. Uh, uh, you know, making it up, things like that. So he started off vaguely like, Paul Krugman is really unhappy with this uncertainty story. In part because when he was writing this stuff, it was around the time there was the Democrat-Republicans fight and the Republicans were claiming the Democrats were messing up the US economy with all the uncertainty. And then Trump happened. I mean, my God, it's like pot calling the kettle black. Um, so I, I, what I want to talk about, this is, fits perfectly with... Uh, you know, ESCO's mandate, and I've been working a lot with the bank and the ONS, as you'll see, multiple projects with both of them, exactly on measurement. So this is going to be, I'm going to talk today entirely on measurement. Krugman had another concern about causality. I'm just not going to go into it because it's a separate issue. But just a very simple thing of how do you measure uncertainty? Um, most people have a view, but I've actually randomly pulled someone from the audience and asked them to literally measure uncertainty. You kind of, you know, it's not that easy to define what it is. So there's an article I saw a while ago that had this wonderful thing, make-believe, but called the uncertainty barometer, which goes from ambiguity, ambiguity all the way up to happiness. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk about three different projects I've been involved in to try and measure uncertainty. The first, um, some of you may know about, I'm not going to spend too long on it, it's, it's using newspapers. It works pretty well. Uh, I go to a lot of conferences in the US, see a lot of papers. There's been an explosion of research on text to data, not just newspapers, company reports, analyst earnings calls, all kinds of things, Twitter. Newspapers are great because they go back more than 100 years, so you can do long-term time series. I'll show you a little flavor of that. Uh, it's not particularly high tech, but it kind of works. And then uh, the second and third is going to have, you know, unfortunately, US... <laughs> US uh, UK collaboration is kind of rock bottom, post the Iran thing, which was pretty awful. You know, uh, we used to have a good, strong cross Atlantic alliance. I'm hoping when Trump moves on, it will return. But right now, I do our best, at least at a statistical level, to try and maintain this. So I'm going to talk about two types of surveys which have a US and a UK version of them, which is one is massive sample but at low frequency. So in the UK, that's been run by the ONS, and the UK, US, that's been run by the census. And another approach, which is smaller sample but very high frequency, in the US it's basically run by the Federal Reserve System, and in the UK by the, by the Bank of England jointly with Nottingham and Stanford. So I'll go through these bit by bit. So I should say, if you have any burning clarifying questions, stop me. I, I'm a, you know, an American academic seminars, people would try and destroy you. It's like if you're not crying by the end of it, you've basically <laughs> done well. Uh, and if you're crying, it's kind of average. <laughs> um, I, I've seen at least two seminars that just don't make it to the hour and a half because, you know, some fight breaks up. Um, but feel free if you have any clarifying questions to stop me, and I think there will be some time at the end, but I'm happy to take questions as well as, you, as, as I go along. So um, I have worked with, I, I'll go through and very clearly highlight the, my co-authors. The, these are different projects, but this is a project with Scott Baker at Northwestern, who's actually a former graduate student of mine, and Steve Davis. And I put up a photo of the website. If you're interested, there's a lot more data on the website. Our data is now being also used by Fred and Bloomberg and Reuters, etc. So the basic idea, this came out from a conversation I had with Steve Davis in about 2009, trying to measure policy uncertainty. So if you remember back then, in the US, uh, there was the TARP program, and numbers like trillion-dollar numbers were being talked about in Congress, which is unbelievable that people talk about trillion-dollar stimulus. I mean, I always thought a million was a, was a lot. You know, then you hit billion, and they're, they're literally talking about vast, vast stimulus packages, and it's flip-flopping across the house. The stock market was bouncing up and down. Nobody knew what was going on. And so we wanted to get a measure of policy uncertainty, not just economic, but economic policy uncertainty. And we spent a long time thinking about how to do it, and we came up with something which is fine, I wouldn't say it's perfect, which is newspapers. So I'll tell you what, and you know, over time it's worked, and we've added a lot of countries, a lot of different angles. Other, many of this has been put forward by other countries, like you know, many of these countries, other teams have done it. I'll tell you about the basic idea. So the basic idea, what we started with, was a monthly US index. And the idea is to search newspapers for the frequency of three terms in conjunction. So it needs an E word, so <coughs> economic or economy, needs a P word, regulation, deficit, Federal Reserve, Congress, legislation, and White House. 
and it needs a U word, uncertain or uncertainty. Notice here the word policy isn't here. Why? Because you're trying to minimize both type 1 and type 2 errors. So type 1 errors is you accidentally trigger an article that you know, talks about insurance policy but isn't really about an uncertainty. And type 2 is where you miss something out and we use the word ambiguity that can talk about uncertainty. So we have a whole paper on trying to minimize these errors and we read thousands of articles and kind of machine learned off it. But this roughly works. Um, we divide the count of articles by, by these articles. So if an article has what, each one of these three terms, it gets tagged as a one. We divide it by the count of all articles in that month. We then normalize each of the ten newspapers and take the average. One thing you may worry about and wonder about in text is, why don't we do something more sophisticated, like actually download the article and say, are these in the title? Are these in the same sentence? The beauty of this approach is it turns out we don't need the article. So it's free to fire off to the New York Times a search query. They'll tell you back how many articles meet this. It would be 11. So that gives us 11. Then we ask to send a blank search of, say, 212. And we know that 11 over 212 articles are within that range. It's very expensive to actually download newspaper articles and get the content of them. So this is free. You just fire off to the search thing once, you know, once a month to do it. So that, that's the idea. What does the index look like? Uh, oh, so here are the 10 US newspapers. They're pretty standard. Of these 10, uh, on the Genskan Shapiro Index, the Wall Street Journal is the most right-wing. If, you, if you've read the Wall Street Journal, the news is fine. The editorial is pretty out there. Uh, the Washington Post is the most left-wing, and some of the editorials I feel are similarly in the reverse direction, but mostly they're pretty mainstream. They're the biggest 10 US newspapers. So here's the US uh, policy, Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. It goes back to 1985, just because it's hard to get searchable papers before then. We have a longer index that goes back to 1900. There are a lot of newspapers that go back that far. You just have to be careful about composition. And it's monthly. It's normalized to 100 before 2010. It basically looks pretty sensible. So here's Black Monday. Uh, Black Monday is the biggest stock market crash, at least, yeah, I think, in the US. I think, well, in the US for sure in history, the stock market fell 20% which is like enormous. The second biggest crash was about 9%. I mean, this, this was a total outlier. After this happened, there's a lot of debate in the SEC about reforming markets. Gulf War I, that was Saddam Hussein's surprise invasion. Obviously, a lot of policy uncertainty about what the Americans would do. Clinton election, that was a very marginal win, and so on. You can see there are two big spikes. One is after the Great Recession. This, this is, I think, policy responding to economics. So... This would be Krugman's critique that, look, there is lots of policy uncertainty, but it's in response to trying to fix a collapsing economy. Here feels much more like policy first, in the first Brexit and then Trump. You can argue that in response to economic situations, but they're much more slow moving. So in particular, recently, there's been a lot of increase in uncertainty, which is very political in nature. And certainly personally, this, we, were, we were just very... Very fortunate in timing and putting this index together, and, and then this happened. Brexit and Trump has generated a lot of interest in this. Um, one of the nice things about newspapers is you can also do more detailed searches. So you can also require it to mention a word on health, like hospital, health, nurse, doctor, and you can get a health index in red, or you can get the defense index. You also require the, new, the paper to mention you know, war, military, defense. You can see they look sensible. Here's the defense spikes in the wars, 9-11. Here's health spikes under Hillary Clinton when Bill Clinton, her husband, was the president, the uh, health care initiative, and more recently, you know, the, the creation and now dismantling of the affordable care. <coughs> so there's a UK EPU. Um, we use the 11 largest newspapers, uh, which you can imagine are kind of going to be the, I all, all in detail, it's going to be like the Guardian, you know, the Independent, the Times, the Financial Times. Uh, telegraph, etc. And again, it looks kind of sensible. The interesting thing for the UK is a lot of these spikes are foreign. So the US kind of sets its own agenda. If you go back to the US, Saddam Hussein's invasion was a, was a foreign-induced political uncertainty shock. In the UK, about half of these is the UK being kind of, you know, a smaller boat hit by waves. For example, Trump has, you know, clear implications for the UK and is generating a lot of domestic policy uncertainty. Here's Europe. Um, the European index, we just used the 10 major European newspapers. Europe, Europe went into recession slightly later. There's been much more uncertainty over you know, the, the ongoing, simmering southern European crisis, and that basically rolled into Brexit and Trump. So Europe has seen a big step-up increase in policy uncertainty, as reported at least by the newspapers, and it hasn't really dropped. So I'm not going to talk any more about this. In the paper and a lot of other work, we show these 
these policy uncertainty measures are very correlated with other measures of uncertainty people use, like stock market volatility or forecast of disagreement. There's a whole industry of proxies for uncertainty. The rest of the talk, I'm going to try and talk about directly measuring it. Um, this is one proxy. It focuses on one subcomponent, which is policy. Before we move on, any, any questions at this point? So, great question. It would. So, one of the things we did, we worried about all kinds of issues. One, that being one of the most important is we we had undergrads. Uh, it sounds awful, but they were paid, and it's not such a bad job. <laughs> read ten thousand newspapers. I mean, they were paid to read. We had them read randomly selected ten thousand news articles, which actually overlapped ten percent, so you could cross check them, and it was kind of a machine learning process. Um, and then used that we had a. Lots of different, so, and so one thing on, we, we're using that actually to minimize type one and type two errors. But another thing is you had them record how many are about uncertainty decreasing. And the answer is about 3%, so it's not much. The reason is there seems to be a massive natural bias towards negative newspaper. I don't, there must, I'm presuming there's some journalists here, but you know, journalists don't tend to write good news stories. <laughs> they tend to write bad news stories. And so almost always it's about uncertainty increasing. You're right. So th there's two ways of thinking about it. One is uh, what I'm going to think of as the Geiger counter version, which is we want to record some truth and we have a noisy measure. In that case, I suppose, as long as the journalists are producing articles in a reasonably stable way, it doesn't matter how many people write the newspaper. As long as they're producing articles that are kind of sensible, that's fine. The other way is actually these newspapers influence what people do. And so in the world of fake news, you start to worry more about that, like Fox, you know, Fox. Fox is tethering to reality. If you think that's drifting away, that could influence things. Um, most of the, so it is true that new, one of the reasons you stop here is newspapers have changed over time. So in the US, our newspapers, the number of pages has fallen by two thirds. So I would say this is quite reliable at high frequency. We go back to 1900. I've been talking to a lot of journalists and historians of media. Going back to 1900, things have changed more radically. There's the muckrakers in the 20s and 30s. From the 60s onwards, there's much more interest in economic news. So I would say at lower frequency, you've got to be careful here. The sense is, you know, literally, it's like a glass is half full. There aren't that many or even any other long-run indicators. So you're right that at lower frequency, spikes like this, Brexit and Trump election, I don't think newspapers are changing. Going back to 97, you're probably OK. They haven't fundamentally changed. If you go back to the 50s, more of a problem is actually going forwards, 10 years from now. So it's certainly the case. I remember talking to um, oh, sorry, it's Larry Summers I was talking to about this. And Larry Summers was saying he noticed a difference in administrations under the Obama administration. Was it the Clinton administration? It must have been. But under one of the early administrations, they were always focused on getting things out by 4 p.m. because that was the daily news cycle, whereas nowadays it's 24-7. It just goes up on the internet. So there was less of an obsession in the White House with a certain deadline. So there are changes. I don't want to claim this is a perfect measure. With a lot of this tech stuff, language has changed, actually. Another thing, if you go to Google Engram, I know uh, Hal Varen is talking about Google stuff, but Google Engrams has a fantastic product which looks at the frequency of the word in books. And if you look at the word uh, uh, economics, for example, that has a huge surge in the 30s, but it's home economics. It's not, you know, our profession. And uncertainty has a surge in like the 40s with Savage and some of the early statisticians in the 50s. So you have, you, you have to be careful on a number of things. Newspaper circulation is, is one of them. But yeah, I think this is good at high frequency. So within a five year period, it's great. Over 20, 30 years, you've got to be more nervous. And you just want to look at other stuff. Yeah, Diane. I'm just, sorry, Diane. I'm guessing people who are outside can't hear us. So I'll give you a microphone. Is there meaning to the scale, and can you compare countries? Um, no, you can't. So on this, it's a relative frequency. So in Italy, for example, their newspapers are full of lots of sports pages. So, you know, the scale looks lower if you looked at the absolute frequency because there's loads of stuff on, on football. I was about to say soccer. There's loads of stuff on football. Um, so you can't, you can only compare within countries. I actually have a project just starting with some of the RMF, David Fracheri, which is using the Economist Intelligence Unit. 
So I don't know, I, you know, we just started it, but the EIU has been writing country reports <coughs> since the late 80s, I think, certainly early 90s, and in that, in theory, you can compare in the cross-section. So, no, this is kind of like indices. Um, I saw Mary O'Mahony and Nick Alton. I, you know, I know there's huge problems. I remember reading their book about comparing GDP across countries, which is really hard to do. In this case, we kind of gave up. You can intertemporally compare, but not cross-section. Um, Keep moving now. Please. Okay, so these are, all good, these are all proxies, but we don't have actual data. So I'm going to talk about two surveys. Uh, one, which is national statistics, ONS, census-based, and the other is kind of bank Nottingham based at high frequencies. Let's start with the first. So this is called MOPS, the Management Organizational Practices Survey. This is the US arm, because I thought you'd forget MOPS. I put up some photos uh, of actual MOPS. Uh, turns out in America, people don't really use these things. I'm not quite sure. All British people know what MOPS is. Americans, I don't really know what Americans do. They just don't have fun. Uh, there are other items, weird stuff like hot. My wife was in Glasgow, and she tried to get a hot water bottle and just no one could understand what. Maybe it's California, just they do not exist. We had loads of like, sorry, I don't you know. But there aren't mops. Uh, anyway, so this is a joint work with Steve Davis, Lucia Foster, Brown Lacking, Scott Allmacher, and Itai Supporter, and it's building on a more general project with Eric, who I know is here, Ebrin Johnson and John Van Reenham, where we've been doing a lot of work with the census looking at data-driven decision-making, management, and organizational practices. So um, in mid 2011 and mid-2016, we sent out, uh, or the census, not us actually, we're very clear, it's the census. We were what's called the project sponsors. So Eric, John, I, Steve Davis raised about a million dollars in both years. So in 20, uh, 2009 and 2014, we raised a million dollars and sponsored the census to run, the US census to run a survey on its already existing manufacturing frame. So something called the Annual Survey of Manufacturing, it surveys about 50,000 American plants. It represents most employment in the U.S. because they oversample larger ones. We sent them out twice, mid-2011. Uh, they're asking about the year calendar year 2010, and mid-2016 asking about the calendar year 2015. Uh, this is relatively quick. Some of the questions look cognitively hard, but having done a lot of testing, the upside of this survey, as I'll show you in a minute, is you don't need to go to the filing cabinet. What people turn out they hate responding to is things were asked for employment and sales numbers going back seven or eight years because they have to go back to the filing cabinet. Some of the questions shown in a minute feel a bit like a maths test, uh, so they're a bit hard, but, but it turns out that it's reasonably easy to do. We got about a 75% response rate. I'm sure it was aided in large part by you know, these six words, if you ever want to run a survey, they're very helpful. Your response is required by law, uh, <laughs> particularly in bold at the beginning of the leading paragraph. Uh, you, know, you can imagine the 25% that didn't, that, that explains the US's very high prison population. So, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, in the ones they don't chat, I don't know what they do, but it's, I, I think they find them some amount. But the 75% the is about the upper end for uh, firm surveys in the US. It's very hard to get the other. Some of the 25%, they don't exist. They just have a mailing frame, so they have no idea whether it never comes back with the plant is dead. Eventually, it might happen. Um, so what was unique in the 2015 wave was they asked expectational questions. So just to show you, the first things you ask for the calendar year 2015, remember, they're being surveyed typically, and they're responding, you should have in mind something like June 2016. So they're asked, what was your shipments, which is basically sales last year, they know that. Uh, what do you estimate it for this year? They're about halfway through the year, so I have a pretty good guess, but it's not definitive. And then, what's the much more complicated thing? For 2017, what would you estimate? And here are the values from what's called the vignette. We actually gave them an example, which the census never do, because we worry about anchoring. I'll show you in a minute, it doesn't seem to have done it, but here's the example. We asked them, what would you estimate your shipments would be your lowest, the low, medium, high, and highest values? And what's the probability such that they add to 100%? So this is a kind of a complicated question. We'll go through. We did a lot of testing. I went on many visits, putting this in front of managers and seeing how much they can answer. And I'll show you in a minute. Basically, 85% of respondents could properly answer this. So what is this? This is an expectational question. You can see you can easily get their mean expectations, but given you've got five bins, you can get a correct measure of subjective uncertainty. The extent to which they honestly answer this, you're getting finally the truth of what subjective uncertainty is for sales for 2017. Now, I should point out this is very rich because there are nine degrees of freedom. These five numbers have to add to 100. So you've got five free boxes and effectively four free boxes here. So you've got nine degrees of freedom. If you know statistics, you know, for example, normal only has two moments. And, you know, skewed normal has three. So nine degrees of freedom means you can have a pretty... Uh, 
complicated, weird, and wonderful distribution. And I assure you, many of them have very weird numbers, like 90, 0, 0, 5, 5. Like, why would you do that? I don't know, but they do. Uh, all kinds of really odd stuff comes out. And one thing while, you're, while we're here, initially we actually, there's, there's another way to ask these expectational questions, which is what they do for macro forecasts. If you've ever used something like the Server Professional Forecast or the Bank of England's GDP forecast, they have bins. So the Bank of England, so I'm looking at Paul, because I've we talked about this a lot. So they send you a, a, a survey saying, what's your probability of GDP growth to be like 3% or less, 3 to 2, 2 to 1, 1 to 0, up to you know, 3% or more, 7 or 8 bins, and you put probabilities in it. The problem with that is it doesn't work well for firms because the range of growth outcomes is way too big. So if GDP is never going to be less than 3, and it's never, frankly, very likely to be more than 4. So that gives you, you know, 7 bins if you want to do it for the nearest percent. For firms, if you go down to North Carolina, uh, if you're a furniture maker, minus 20% growth is, like, fantastic. And if you're in, like, Silicon Valley, plus 50% is terrible. So, and there's no way, we initially had bins, but we had like a hundred bins, and you know, you can imagine having a piece of, it, it was just a logistical nightmare. So instead, we ended up saying, well, why don't you define your lowest, low, medium, high, and highest, and then put your probabilities against it. And that works very well. And this approach, I'm going to show you, has been exactly used in the, U, in the UK ONS and in various other things. So it's a very practical reason. It turns out to work well. We do that for... Uh, Investment, employment, and materials, so you just do it four times over. Um, who responds to these surveys? So are we getting anything meaningful? It turns out, because it's the census, and it will be very similar to the ONS, actually pretty numerous, kind of senior-ish, but not <coughs> typically top people respond. So the respondees are mostly managers of finance. And if you look at who they are, the most common person is the plant manager, the finance controller, CEO, or CFO. So... The, this is the category I worry about a lot. I really don't want HR or admin filling this survey out. Thankfully, that's only 4%. You know, missing might be mostly them, who knows. But certainly at worst, it's 10% of people that really don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Not to, yeah, anyway, we should move on. <laughs> um, so then the question is, you know, having, if you go back, this, this feels a lot like, I mean, this is cognitively quite hard. So for, for you as individuals, the similar thing is asked next year, in well, 2019, what's your lowest, low, medium, high, and highest income as you report on your tax return? And put probabilities on it. So all of us have some uncertainty about it. I doubt anyone can totally predict what number that will be. And I could probably do it, take me a bit of thinking. It's not straightforward. The question is, how many people filled it out? Um, well, the highest frequency of probability distribution was all missing. So 7% of people just skipped it and actually went on to fill out later questions. So there are 7% of people who just basically... I don't know, don't understand it or found it too difficult or, you know, it's America. They thought, you know, I shouldn't swear, but some swear word followed by government and then <laughs> skipped. I mean, I got, I, when you do cognitive testing, you go around with the census and you test it and they say, you're right, this is, you know, I'm part of the census and you hear the venom towards the government. Um, and then the next most common at 5% is what looks pretty sensible, 5, 20, 50, 25. Then there's a bunch of sensible, here's the vignette score, if you remember carefully, the example we gave them had 5, 10, 60, 20, 5. So 5% of people gave that. That's anchoring. Probably if we hadn't suggested an example, that might have been 1 or 2%. So anchoring, so I don't know, 3, 4%. It's not that bad. Here's uniform. Quite a lot of people give 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. It's not unreasonable. But generally, people are mostly giving reasonable numbers. Um, we're going to define a good response. It turns out 85% of people give a good response. What is a good response? Your probability is sum to 100, or actually they sum between 95 and 105 because of rounding. 90% of people do that. So remember, the 10% that fail, 7% leave it blank, 3% can't add to 100. They, give, you know, <laughs> they just give some strange numbers. Uh, then there's what's called no point mass. So you don't put 100% in one bin, or even worse, some people just give the same number for the outcomes. They carefully construct probabilities like this, and then for sales happen, they put 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. They're like, why did you do that? But anyway, there are people that do that. And then outcomes are weekly monotonic. The thing that I think, we were amazed at how many people fail this. But just to be clear, what it means is when it says lowest to highest, this, this is uh, higher than that. That's higher than that. But, so there are, and if it's the reverse, we flip it around. We, we're, trying to, we're trying not to lose data, but there are people that would do 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 4,000. 
Well, like what I, but anyway. <laughs> if, if you can identify them, they are people you want to play poker with, I think. <laughs> but, so, all, that turns out to be the most, weirdly enough, I, I don't know, I mean, some of it's going to be misreading and stuff, but the, collectively, 85% are good. I should say the 50% that are bad, that's not random at all. So, you're sig massively, significantly more likely to give a good response if you have a high management score. So, than the work I mentioned with Eric and, and, and John and others, that's hugely predictive. You're more likely to have a good response if you're big, if your employees earn a lot, which basically means they're high skilled, if the managers are more educated, if you're a multinational. So it's not random. High ability, productive, well-managed firms can fill out, can you know, fill out probability distributions. Chaotic, badly managed small firms can't. Um, so you know, most people can fill it out. Here are the numbers. Here are the overall probability distrib distributions. They're pretty normal. So here's the average for the four outcomes, 10, 20, 40, 20, 10. Here's the average for the actual values they put in the bins. So for sales, their lowest value is typically 10% below. I've normalized the, the center to 100 for, to 1. The highest value is about 10% above. So most people are reporting low to high ranges of 20%. Seems, I guess, reasonable. For investment, that's the category that's huge variation. So not surprising, there's a lot more variation in people's investment. It's far harder to predict. For employment and materials, it looks like sales. So what are some stylized facts we see? Um, one is that the probabilities look pretty sensible. So if you look at forecast versus last year's growth rate, that's very highly correlated. Firms have persistence in growth. This is a simple check, and you see it. I mean, there's some weird numbers, but basically, if you grew fast last year, you predict growing fast this year. You see that's true in the data. If you look at actual data, growth is, is highly positively correlated. Uh, slightly harder, subjective uncertainty is highly correlated with historic volatility. Again, it means that subjective uncertainty numbers we're getting look pretty sensible, and I'll tell you some tougher tests in a minute, but if you've been volatile in the past, you'll say up here, your dispersion of outcomes and probabilities is far wider. If you've not been volatile in the past, it's far narrower. So this is, in a sense, the first basic check. It looks like the uncertainty measures we're getting look very consistent with historic volatility. This is really important. Otherwise, you'd be worried that they're just writing any old garbage down in the, in the, in the responses. Um, as firms get bigger, sales uncertainty drops a lot. It's maybe not surprising. Them, you know, there's law of large numbers kicks in, but they're much less uncertain if they're big. They're also much less uncertain if they're old. This is kind of interesting because US and UK firms are aging, so I guess one natural process is their uncertainty is falling over time. So you can think of startups are very, very uncertain. This scale is pretty big. So startups are very, very uncertain the first five years. By the time you get to 30 years plus, uncertainty is almost fine. Sure. Eric. So quickly on no, the take that microphone. Yes. yes. On the, on the size downward sloping, how much of it can be explained by just the law of large numbers? If, you know, if a plant is 10 times bigger, is it, is it you know, square root of 10 times less than certainty, or is, is it more than that or less than that? Um, I need to check. There's some, some cross-correlation across your units. It's heavily, sorry. So one thing is we can look at plant versus firm size, and plant matters. So just to explain, um, in the US census, and the UK is similar, there's slightly different structure, you, you collect data at the plant. So, uh, you know, you might collect data from your slough plant and from your Reading plant and from your Nottingham plant. And we also have data at the firm level. It turns out the plant size, but all the expectations of the plant, the plant size is more informative, which means a lot of that is this law of large numbers. So bigger firms are also less uncertain, but mostly it's plant size. So I think a lot of it, but not all of it, is law of large numbers going to be. Right. But we, Just we to could, be clear, the law of large do. numbers would predict a very specific relationship between the size and the, and the uncertainty, right? I mean, there'd be a, a particular If you think different subcomponents are independent. Yeah, if, so they're, the, if they're IID, yeah. Yeah, so we, I can check that. I, we should have a look at that. Yeah, Jonathan. So can I just ask quickly, sure. maybe you're going to come to this, Nick, but you, you might say there were events like, you know, the financial crisis and Brexit, where it's actually very difficult to put any probability numbers on there. So, you know, in a Knightian kind of sense, they're very uncertain. Are you going to talk about that a little bit? Again, great, because uh, when you talk about, I, I wasn't going, but yet, so Gagan and I know, so, so Phil, Phil was said, a bunch of us that have been doing the UK, so, and Phil is, I saw something, have been doing, we, in the UK, they did the cognitive, the people that did this, a lot of the follow up surveys, we had a fascinating telephone call with them, and, and, and put, we asked them when people don't fill it out. Why? And quite often they said, oh, they say, well, like, it's impossible to predict the future because of Brexit. 
So a bunch of the missings are, are because of 19 uncertainty. So just to be clear, in economics, there's, so if, I, I don't know how much everyone knows, but there's two definitions. What's often traditionally called risk is there's a probability distribution that's known. And that's called risk. I'm conflating with uncertainty, but under Frank Knight or this kind of the Earth Savage definition, that would be risk. What's called uncertainty traditionally, which is often called nineteen uncertainty, is you know the support, you maybe don't even know the support, you just don't know the distribution. So you find it impossible to predict anything. And they would say, I just can't predict anything whatsoever, so I'm not going to fill it out, and this is ludicrous. And they get kind of angry, actually, about it. Uh, so, so we didn't ask any further at that point, but. One of the things we can look at, actually, is because you have the administrative data, you can look at the volatility of their future realizations. My, you can look at their employment because they make tax returns and their sales. So you can actually say, let's break it out to the responders and non-responders. And is it the case that the non-responders actually went on to have higher volatility? So one of the fantastic things about the whole ONS and the same in the US census infrastructure um, and John and I were talking earlier about this, is you can match in administrative data. So even in the non-responders, you actually get to find out a lot about. Right. So, and then the final, the final figure looks kind of weird. It's not V for victory. Uh, I watched The Darkest Hour on the plan, the other with Churchill. So it's not, it, it's, this is, um, we plot prior shipments growth last year minus the long run average against uh, your uncertainty. And what this tells you is, if last year, so the year before the survey, which is 2014 to 15, you're at your long-run average growth rate, that would be zero. Your uncertainty going forward is low. If last year you had a particularly high growth rate or a particularly low growth rate, your uncertainty is much higher. In some ways, it isn't surprising when you think about it. If you suddenly got hit by a huge positive or a huge negative growth episode, you're much more uncertain. This kind of links into why recessions have periods of much higher uncertainty. One of the stylized facts in the uncertainty literature, recessions have periods of much higher uncertainty. It's because a huge bunch of firms gets kicked into this lecture. And then finally, one of the things this project was about is we have all these proxies like volatility, options, implied vol, forecast, and disagreement who have used in this literature for decades to proxy for uncertainty. Do they actually match up to real numbers that people tell us, the subjective expectations? So for around 5,000 plants in the census that are owned by publicly listed parents, so we trace them up to the publicly listed parents, we look at the New York Stock Exchange, we look at the actual implied vol and their options, or we look at the realized vol, or for their forecast for the earnings, we look at the disagreement, and they're super correlated. So the idea is, you know, for the publicly listed subsidiaries, for the publicly listed firms, so their stock market price is bouncing around a lot when we survey the managers, uh, they, they are much more uncertain about the future than if they're not which means these are pretty reasonable pro pro proxies, which is a, good, a big deal because this is what we've been using. I know the bank has a, an uncertainty index based on things like this, which is disagreement and volatility, and it suggests it is linked to actually un uh, underlying uncertainty. Um, so we're currently doing a few other things. One is looking at forecast error properties. You know, I've been listening to uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, the Danny Kahneman kind of psychology, uh, kind of well, behavioral economics thing. And you see it very much in the survey. They're, they're over-optimistic, so the mean forecasts are way too high. And they're overconfident, as in the dispersions is far too narrow. So these are definitely not rational expectations. Um, the forecast errors themselves are highly correlated to original uncertainty. So when we start to get the realizations data out, if they're very uncertain, they're much more likely to make a mistake. That's almost you know, a quick coast check of this. And most interestingly, for productivity, forecast errors themselves are highly correlated to firm ability. So if you look at firms with very small forecast errors on average, they tend to be well-run and productive. So what does it tell you? Maybe part of being productive and high productivity is you make good forecasts. You can imagine if I'm making good forecasts, I don't tend to overbuy capital or underbuy capital labor. So this is something we're kind of excited about, linking up to productivity, linking up to big data. Is it the case that well-managed firms that use big data are better at forecasting things and tend to make less mistakes? So now, UK, uh, Management Expectations Survey with Gigan and Awano, Ted Dolby, Paul Mies, and Rebecca Riley, Tatsuro Senga. Tatsuro is on like a video, he couldn't get in, so you know, should wave to Tatsuro, I think he's in another room. Jenny Bias and Philip, Phil Wales. Uh, I couldn't find, you know, a nice visual image. If you put an MES into Google image, nothing great comes. This is the best. Uh, red socks. I will go with the socks to try and help people remember MES, so here's the socks. Theme. So the UK ONS is a similar type thing. The challenge it had is it wasn't um, 
mandatory. So if you're going to be voluntary, it's best to put it not in bold, you know, in the middle, in the middle of a paragraph followed by the word however. <laughs> so the, otherwise, very, very similar. Uh, the, US, the, US, sorry, the UK is much wider. So the nice thing about the UK is it sent out the businesses and to manufacturing and services. So the US one was only manufacturing. An odd thing about the American statistical apparatus is they have loads of data manufacturing, but they're pretty poor outside it. The UK is much better. For example, I have a paper in the AER many years ago looking at services and retail in the UK. And people always ask, how on earth did you get that data? And I said, well, the UK has annual service sector data. The US doesn't, for budgetary reasons. It, anyway, so this is much broader. Um, it's very similar in structure. Slightly lower response rate. I don't think it matters too much. The other thing is they ask questions on GDP. So they ask the standard questions. And if you remember the numbers, these may look very familiar. They actually use the same vignette in the UK as we used in the, in the US. This vignette worked well, so we used the same example. The nice thing is, in the UK, also ask questions on GDP growth rates. So why would we do that? The problem with asking questions about firms' own outcomes is they could make a mistake because not either they forecast badly or they get hit by a shock. So if I have a great forecast, but I get hit by a negative shock, I have a forecast error, but it may not be my fault. Whereas with GDP, you can actually compare these forecasts to professional forecasts made at the same time and get a sense of whether these are rational or not. So we went to ask them GDP forecasts. What do we find? Keeping on the time, Nick, just so we give a bit of time for questions. Oh, yeah, okay. So here's, um, so here's a GDP forecast in the UK. Uh, forecasters for GDP are over-pessimistic in the UK, particularly smaller firms, and way too dispersed. So here's professionals. Professionals in the Treasury are predicting about 1.4. Firms are predicting about 0.5. So whether that's Brexit, whether they're naturally pessimistic, they're optimistic on their own sales, so pessimistic on GDP. That's a pretty big gap between what the Treasury's range and level is and what firms' range and level is. So I think it's a really interesting finding. It would be good to look into further. Uh, we'll follow it up. You know, our well-managed firms here are badly managed firms who haven't done it, but we're kind of struck by this. The GDP <coughs> forecasts are pretty out of line from firms, assuming they understand it. Um, another interesting thing is firms' GDP forecasts are strongly correlated to their own growth expectations. So that shouldn't be the case in the sense that if you're making a rational GDP forecast, it should be independent of what you're doing. You're forecasting the entire economy. Martin. Sorry, <coughs> is the Treasury measure asking about the dispersion of forecasts or individual forecasts is uncertain? The Treasury is surveying a number of professionals and asking for probability distributions over their forecasts. So it's the same, it's almost exactly this question. Thank you. And the professionals, I mean, as you would do, if I asked anyone that knows what they're doing, you're not going to be predicting... You know, certainly not going to be predicting this. Uh, I don't know about minus 4%. You know. You're not going to be predicting plus 4 But you see there's quite a lot of density. So on a like-to-like -like basis, professionals are much more positive and much more compact. Um, individuals also seem to struggle to separate out their own experiences in GDP again, which is interesting, which kind of explains maybe some of the micro-macro linkage. That's true for second moments. Uh, so here's uncertainty of their own turnover forecast, here's uncertainty of their own GDP forecast, again, they're upward linked. You know, a lot of this is, you know, having done this, it makes me, uh, you know, enthused slash interested in a lot of this behavioral bias things. These biases are pretty large. Uh, we're speaking to senior managers, their forecasts are pretty good and predictive, which means they're not noise. Um, I think it's unlikely they'd tell us most of the truth and randomly throw in some deliberate bias. I suspect these people do have bias expectations, and it would be useful to analyze them. So I should say, um, you know, the great advantage, you can have massive scale, very high quality responses, very detailed things, and you can match this to a lot of other sensors known as data sets. So, you know, it's been, somehow the PowerPoint PDF thing didn't, didn't quite emerge, but we wanted to thank funding and support. Underneath this is uh, ESCO, sensors, the ONS, etc., but for support for these, uh, for these initiatives. So let's now move to high frequency surveys. So, in the US, uh, there's something called the Survey of Business Uncertainty. Dave Olker, Jose Barrero, Mike Brown, Steve Davis, Brent Mayer, Nick Parker. Um, if you look for SBU, it has self-balancing unicycle. So you try and use that to remember. Uh, and apparently, that no, you no longer need to actually unicycle. You can just get on it and it does it for you. So this is you know, technological change. So in the, this is a very different setup. This is a five-minute monthly interview. So the, the, the approach here is the Atlanta Fed since 2014 has been phoning up 
a representative sample of firms using Dun & Bradstreet and persuading them to be part in, in what's called the survey of business uncertainty. They ring them up, said it's Atlanta Fed, it's joined with Chicago and Stanford, would like to recruit you to the SBU panel. About a third of people after seeing the mid-sing say yes. Uh, they then get sent a short survey each month that lasts for about five minutes. Um, it's been running since 2014. We've done a lot of ongoing testing. And the nice thing about this is you can continuously test and refine it. So, in fact, this was where we developed the approach for using those lowest and highest. Because initially, we sent these guys bins, and we got weird numbers back. And we've also been doing a bunch of what's called A-B testing. So, randomly send all the people with odd numbers, one question, and the even, and the other, and see how things pan out. There's actually two versions of the questions, because five minutes isn't long enough to ask them everything we want. So, we have an A and B version. We just rotate them. So, you don't get the same question every month. Um, we try and keep it about five minutes, it's very quick, and we got about a thousand respondents. So this is a very different flavor. We're trying to get, you know, large, but far less. I mean, this isn't 10 to 50,000, this is only a thousand respondents, but we're trying to get them responding once a month to us, quick time. Similar questions, sales growth rates, what is it, what has it been? And then a similar thing, we're asking them about the outcomes and probability. So this is exactly the same format. Right? The kind of conversion of PDF has messed it up, but underneath it says the lowest to highest bins you then take the numbers and put it into the next question, which should ask you to put the probabilities against them. We persuade them to uh, keep going. We give them instant feedback, and we give them these very high-quality mugs here, modeled by Patricia and Jose. So you can imagine why do they keep responding every month for a five-minute survey. As soon as you fill it out, you get an instant feedback. It's kind of something, and every you know, nine months, we give them a set of mugs. I, I personally wouldn't do it for those... <laughs> those mugs, certainly not because I know how much they cost, but uh, we get a reason. We get actually pretty high retention over time. So what do we find? So one thing is firm subjective uh, forecasts are highly predictive of realizations. So maybe this doesn't seem a big deal, but i come on to why it matters. If you ask firms to forecast, say, their employment growth, and you look at what happens a year later when you actually know the realization, the forecast is extremely accurate. And in fact, if you run regressions of employment growth, Whatever you put in, in the baseline, it's impossible to kill the forecast. So if I run a regression of employment growth, and I put in all the lags of employment growth investment, which is pretty useful predictor, because if you invest a lot, it predicts your positive stock value, whatever you want, and expected employment growth. Expected employment growth is extremely informative, which means these surveys are generating a lot of extra information that we otherwise wouldn't have. You see that in the first moment, you also see it in the second moment. So if you look at the forecast error for employment growth a year later, we compare it to the subjective uncertainty we gave them, again, it's very highly correlated. So what this enables us to do is generate indices, which is what the Atlanta Fed is trying to do. So in the US, this, the Federal Open Market Committee is the US version of the Monetary Policy Committee that meets as you know, regularly to set interest rates. They want confidence intervals for businesses. There's confidence intervals for consumers from Michigan. There's actually nothing that's that fantastic on businesses. So right now, we're using this to try and create a first moment confidence interval. So in uh, blue is the smooth confidence interval we get from our survey. And for example, here in red is the S&P 500. You can see they're reasonably highly correlated. We'll probably wait another six months to a year to get up to kind of four or five years worth of data and then release it. But so one ambition is literally to feed into the FOMC a business confidence interval that's based on a representative large sample across the US and can be done for real time. And this is the first moment. What certainly that doesn't ex exist at all is an uncertainty in the index. So here's the second moment, average across our firms. There isn't much else to easily compare this against. VIX is one thing, which is stock market volatility. Most uncertainty measures on stock markets are actually trending down in the US. Political ones are trending in the opposite direction. But uh, certainly the, the subjective uncertainty from this survey is kind of matches up to stock market volatility. So that's the US situation. What about the UK? So the UK, we have a bit, I couldn't find. The UK is DMP, the decision maker panel. If you look on DMP, it's really boring. You know, and Google images, lots of things about data processing and electronic equipment. So instead, I just went for the photos of the team. Uh, this is Phil Bunn, Scarlett Chen, Paul Meason. Uh, Phil is here, Paul is here. Pavel, I'm not sure if Pavel's here. Greg Thwaites, Gary Young. If you look carefully, I notice there's one, there's one extra photo I snuck in. You know, I'll, I'll come back to who it is, and, it, and, it, and it's not Greg Thwaites. <laughs> um, so the Bank of England Internet Survey is a similar thing. Again, you're going to see a very common pattern here. 
five bins, lowest, low, mid, middle, high, highest, uh, probabilities against them. Um, the Bank of England, this thing, there are several slides that seem to be combined into one, but underneath it, it's going to show something so I'm very, very impressed by, which is the number of firms in the UK DMP. So I guess I can claim anything since you can't actually see the figures at all, but it goes from a scale from zero to 3,000, and a number of firms, despite starting two years later than the US, were now at 3,000 firms. So 4,000. A product, one of the few times I've seen British productivity way above American productivity. <laughs> I was going to say the reason is A, we have much better mugs, but the mug photos disappeared. Uh, and we have a really efficient team in Nottingham. So here's the, the final photo is the one you can see. This is Kate Fisher in one of the survey rooms. So we've got two rooms in Nottingham with lots of people coming in and making phone calls, persuading people to take part. So we have 4,000 firms. Uh, that in itself is pretty amazing. They're also highly representative of the business, business register. We use Amadeus, so they're a complete cross-section of the UK. They're geographically very representative. So the DMP in the UK is now by far the best firm So We want to get expectations from firms or information from firms. It's by far the biggest sample, and it's representative of the population sampling frame. It has big enough samples, we can say, give a number for Scotland or Wales or for Northern Ireland. <coughs> so what do we get out of this? Um, Oh, yeah, I was going to, so what do we get out of this? So I'm actually going to finish by talking about some of the special questions from Brexit. One of the fantastic things about the survey is you can actually add questions in at high frequency. So if Mark Carney says, I really care about firms' views on Brexit, we can, you know, that month put a question in and about three weeks later give him an answer. So it's harder. The, the ONS survey and the census survey are fantastic for huge scale and matching to administrative data, but it's hard to change quickly. This is the big upside we can quickly change. So here is one of the questions we've been running regularly, which is, to what extent is Brexit a source of uncertainty? And you can see two things. Uh, one is about, you know, there are about 20% of firms that say Brexit's not important at all. About 80% of firms saying Brexit is one of many sources, of which uh, around 40% mention Brexit as one of, one, of, you know, one of the top, if not the largest, source of uncertainty. So certainly our respondents claim Brexit uncertainty is important. More interestingly, this doesn't seem to have fallen. If anything, it's risen over time. So here is the first survey of September 2016, right after the vote. If you remember back, it was, you know, everyone was astounded. I was in London and was voting in this. Everyone was kind of astounded and shell-shocked at what happened. We're now asking a year and a half later, and the number of people that are saying it's not important is actually less. If anything, it's a downward trend. So the uncertainty over Brexit is not subsiding. Our firms are telling us actually it's constant. It's not statistically increasing, but it's definitely not subsiding. What about the impact on Brexit on sales? This is another question we've been asking reasonably consistently. Uh, again, two stylized facts. One is there's clearly a net negative expectation for Brexit on sales. There are... 5% of people who see it's positive, that's pretty constant. There's a smaller group that see So by the way, this is large positive. This is defined as 10% or more. This is, you know, 1 to, one, one to 9, 0, minus 1 to 9, 10% or less. And there's a small positive group, but that's falling. No impact falling. And you can see on the negatives, both groups are rising. So A, there is a clear majority of firms that think that Brexit's going to reduce sales, and B, that group is actually rising over time. So, well... Whatever euphoria there was initially from this group, they are subsiding over time. So the Brexit process and debate, I think, is making firms more pessimistic over the last year and a half. It isn't just sales. So if you look at other outcomes, so this is net, this is net positives minus net negatives. Sales is negative. Exports is kind of zero. You can imagine conditions are down, but the exchange rates offset that. Investment is negative. The cost numbers look positive. So... On average, firms are pretty pessimistic about Brexit. If you weight this by firm size, these numbers look worse. Big firms tend to be more pessimistic than small firms. Um, then who's, who, you know, what, how do we break down by types of firms? So you can look at, if you're an exporter, and particularly if you export to the, UK, the European Union, you're the most pessimistic. If you're an exporter outside the EU, you're slightly less. And the least pessimistic are non-exporting firms. So even they are pessimistic <coughs> about Brexit. So... It's not particularly, you know, certainly not entirely driven by trade. You look at importers, um, big importers are much more pessimistic than small importers and non-importers. Again, every group is pessimistic on the impact of Brexit on sales. You look at share of EU, non-UK EU nationals in the firm. Again, firms employing a lot of Europeans, 
are much less pessim are much more pessimistic about Brexit, but even firms employing basically no Europeans are still pessimistic about Brexit. So when you put this all together, uh, it's not surprising, but it's somewhat worrying that when you break this down by productivity, the highest productivity firms are the ones that are most pessimistic. Why is this? Well, firms in these two top two quartiles of Brexit tend to be exporting, they tend to be importing, they tend to employ skilled workers, they tend to be in the southeast, they're the most pessimistic. What does this tell you? Brexit is likely to reduce and probably already is reducing productivity growth. Why? Because it's uh, reducing reallocation. So in all, it's like the batting average effect. If you want to increase aggregate productivity, you want productive firms being big, unproductive firms being small. Brexit's doing the reverse. Basically, the lowest skill, least export intensive, probably least R&D intensive, are least negatively affected. So we're trying to quantify that in the, in, in the bank project, but you know, this is not a minor thing because the productivity variation in the cross section is really big. So if low productive firms expand relative to high productive firms, that's not good. The other angle that Brexit affects productivity that we get from the survey is what, what I call the distraction effect. So we asked the CEOs and CFOs how much time did they spend a week spent preparing for Brexit. Now there's a group that spend none. I, I don't know whether they're, you know, my own mind, they're <coughs> pessimistic, optimistic, I don't know what, but they just don't seem to, and there's also uh, a group that spend up to an hour. There's then about 20% that are spending considerable amounts of time preparing for Brexit. If you add all these numbers up, the average CEO or CFO, the, sorry, the top management team in Brexit is, is spending something like uh, about one hour a week uh, preparing. That's about 2% of labor supply, if you think that they have 50 hours a week. Top management team by wage bill is about 10%, so that's 0.2% of labor supply. That's probably reducing productivity by, you know, 0.1 to 0.2 percent. It's not a huge number, but again, the actual just the sheer man, um, as in man slash woman as, of top management time preparing for Brexit is actually pretty large in some of these numbers. So, you know, the benefits of this type of survey are timing. You can get stuff really fast. The flexibility has been great. The Treasury uh, days, the Bank of England suggested questions. We put them in. We pulled them out. We were able to feed them back to the MPC within about a month. And matching can actually link this to Amadeus data. The UK is fantastic because there's a public Amadeus has a it's not perfect, it's not quite as good as the ONS data, but it has kind of a public population database. Um, and I should thank the ESRC and ESCO. So to conclude, um, I think uncertainty is a major economic issue. Unfortunately, it's not good things in my mind at least that have generated it. A huge challenge is measurement. Um, I think surveys offers a way forwards to measure uncertainty. I think there's two approaches and they're complementary large scale ONS type surveys and the high frequency bank Nottingham surveys. And you know, again, coming from the world of fake news, fake facts, uh, it's just so nice that, that there is ESCO and the ONS, uh, and, you know, and the, more generally the bank, and you know, the general British support to uh, doing something like this. Okay, well, thank you for that, Nick. I mean, despite the kind of uh, very encouraging last few slides about what's happening next, I'm sure there are lots of questions, both inside the room and outside the room. And Richard has been gathering questions outside. I want you to come up here, Richard, so people can hear you when you. Oh, you've got a microphone, have you? So, um, and people inside the room, if you can take the microphone so that those can can uh, hear your question. Um, so, who would like to go first with a question? Please. Microphone's coming to you. I'll alternate between inside and outside. Well, uh, absolutely fascinating talk, Nick. Thanks a lot. Um, my question is, is uncertainty or increases in uncertainty always a bad thing? And what I'm thinking of is, suppose I'm a US manufacturer, Trump gets elected, I may be initially rather optimistic because I'm in favor of his tax cutting and deregulatory agenda. But on the other hand, I may worry that he's not actually going to follow through on it or that Congress won't let him. So there is an increase in uncertainty. On the other hand, there's also an increase in optimism. Right. Um, to, so, so two responses. A long and important point in the literature. Uh, is it very um, good question. So two responses. One is, uh, norm historically, uncertainty has gone up with bad times. So if you're a stock market follower, you notice there's a long 
finance literature that stock vol goes up when the stock market drops. More generally, I actually had an early slide I took out, so I was worried. I'm already a bit over time. I was worried to be even more over time. But if you look at various uncertainty metrics, they pretty strongly fall in recessions. So interestingly enough, Brexit and Trump, I mean, I didn't support either of them. I didn't vote for either of them. It's probably pretty clear by now. Uh, if it isn't, I mean, it should be. But, you know, in, in that sense, you could argue they're both m actually mean zero, particularly Trump, you could argue, is a mean zero impact. I don't like Trump's, you know, moral stance and politics, but certainly the business community liked him. So in some sense, it's a pretty rare event that increases uncertainty but doesn't appear to be associated with bad news. So if you really thought that... So one thing is you want to separate out the first and second moment. And this whole literature is a long problem that when uncertainty shocks happen like 9-11, there's also bad news on average. So you need to A, separate them out. B, in terms of the theory, if you're just looking at the uncertainty component, Dixit and Pinback and others argue generally it reduces investment behavior because people pause. There is some other papers. There's an old paper by these guys, Barolan and Strange, arguing that uncertainty can increase R&D because it's like a cool option on the future. So the best example of this would be the late 90s, when everyone was uncertain about the internet, and because you didn't want to miss out, you all rushed to invest. And it's if you have time to build, what you want to you want to set your ships off now, basically, because you don't know what's going to happen down the road. So it is possible that uncertainty is good for business, but I would say at the national level, net net is bad. And you're right, you do have to separate out first moment and second moment effects in order to look at this. So that's the, the separation is more of an empirical point. The theory is generally uncertainty is bad. R and D is the one case where it's kind of ambiguous. Actually. Thank you, Richard. You got one from somewhere else? Then I'll come to you. Yes, um, one question from outside the room. Looking across the piece, do you feel businesses have a positive or negative bias on their future, and does that matter? So the, the evidence here is slightly odd, actually. So there's a long, there's a long literature in psychology that people are, on average, over-optimistic. Uh, there's also a long literature that what's called overconfident. So if you ask people to predict, for example, what range their exam results are coming in, it's typically far too narrow. So people are way too confident about their predictions. So we see both of that in the large-scale census surveys. Um, the only thing that's weird is in the UK ONS survey, when they ask them to forecast GDP, which is an aggregate thing, not their own. They tend to be over-pessimistic and weirdly over-dispersed. So, you know, uh, at some point, hopefully two, three years, I'll have a better answer or put the data together. I would say net-net, typically, you know, the perceived wisdom is people overconfident and over-optimistic. And we mostly get that through in this survey. Um, whether that's bad is another question. I mean, Steve Jobs, people always, you know, Steve Jobs was the most over-optimistic person. Now, his reality distortion field was hear no bad news. The problem, in some ways, that's great, and Steve Jobs actually lives very close to where I now, I mean, he's dead now, but he used to live very close, he lives in very close to Stanford campus, so about two miles away. But the, in some sense, the flip side, there's probably a hundred other entrepreneurs like Jobs that had the same reality distortion field and all went bankrupt. Mm. So it's net-net, it's not totally obvious whether having excessively over-optimistic individuals is good or bad, but it appears in the data that most people are. This, by the way, there's another interesting story, which is you may find CEOs are over-optimistic because that's the way they're selected. So you can imagine that you start off with 1,000 people at the bottom of the firm. 500 are optimistic, take big bets. Some of them pay off. They get noticed. They get promoted. They take big bets again, those that win. You know, there's a horrible selection process. The most over-optimistic people tend to get pulled up to the top of organizations. So to the senior manager here, <laughs> it's telling you something. Yeah, um, conscious of time. So two very quick comments in my question, which blends into the earlier one. Um, first comment was, uh, you could have noise if it's internal budgeting equals a forecast, equals your survey response. People will budget low so they exceed the budget and get their bonus payments. So it's just one area of potential noise that can enter a survey. The second one was, there's a lot of survey questions there about turnover and in my field of disruptive technology, it's not uncommon for companies to become smaller but more profitable because you rip out more costs than you shed in turnover. So it'd be interesting to see how that affects uh, in, the, in a field being, which has been disrupted by tech. And then the question was related to the earlier one and also when you dwelled on the syntax of the meaning uncertainty. If I'm in manufacturing in 2010 in America, I'm pretty certain that my business is in trouble. And by 2015, I'm even more certain that my business is in trouble through globalization and outsourcing of costs, et cetera. Therefore, you have a backward bending curve anomaly of uncertainty could be a good thing because maybe there's green shoots appearing in my business model. So it's just when you talked about the definition of uncertainty, 
And I'm thinking again, my skepticism about surveys is how noise enters. Who, uncertainty could mean different things to different people, especially over time when you already have a fixed view about your, your, your outlook. Um, so you're definitely right. There is an old CBR, well, they're still running, I think the CBR has a survey yeah. in the UK about why you don't invest. And one of the questions was uncertainty about demand. And it's a useful question, but I always struggled a bit with that because that combines both first and second moments. So if I'm pessimistic, it may also be uncertain. We were trying to get it here, separating out whether I'm pessimistic because all my values are low versus I have a high dispersion. And so you're right. You've got to be careful about kind of related to the question earlier uh, from Nick, I think, about um, we have to separate out first and second moments. And there's a problem that's kind of plagued this whole literature. So we're trying to get uncertainty as distinct from expectations. In the US, as it happens, manufacturing, uh, if you look at manufacturing, absolutely fell off a cliff in 2000. It was a slightly different time period from the UK. It completely collapsed in 2000 to about 2009. And then it's been gradually recovering. It's pretty weak. But by 2010, the guys that got killed and the, their workers are voting Trump are basically all out of business. So in some sense, it's just, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's actually on a regular growth. It's weirdly growing. I mean, manufacturing in America hasn't grown since 1980. It has been growing for the last five years. Not much. That's employment. Value added has been growing quite a lot. So the U.S. manufacturing story is output's gone up a lot. Employment hasn't. So they're becoming continuously massively more productive, and a part of it's just offshore. Less cost and possibility. Yeah, I, um, we wondered about it. You're right. So I think as time goes on, we'll ask different questions. In the... Bank of England work, we've been asking about prices, clearly given the bank's mandate, it's important to get some price data. In the census, we've only asked, and the owners, we've only asked about quantities. And you could ask this about anything. At this stage, it's kind of testing out different concepts. The nice thing about the, you know, the bank, the DMP thing is you, could, you can ask these subjective expectation questions about many outcomes. You know, what's your probability Brexit will happen in different years? There's another slide I didn't show you. You can ask them to put percentages to different years, and they will happily do that. And you see a kind of histogram of their views, and there are some people putting some weight into, you know, 2025 and beyond. Right, I've got one outside the room and four inside the room waiting, so work that way. So, Richard, and then along the front here and over that way. In the uh, work you presented, um, do you see any impact of uncertainty coming from the way we present statistics or debates about economic statistics? So the example I've got given here is the recent debates around use of RPI or CPI. Do you see those sorts of things coming through and having an influence? It's a great question. Well, I've never looked at it. It's a great question. The news would be the best way to look at that, actually. The nice thing about news stuff, going right back to the beginning, is you can be very refined about it. And there's something called News Bank, which has, like, thousands of newspapers. And if you went into news... So you'd have to define your terms. So if you define your term statistic... Um, I don't know how else you define it. You know, you look in the word ONS statistic and a couple of others and look at how it's linked. You probably what you find is you trick, you find a few spikes that would actually be, you go back and look at them, you'd find they're connected to real events. So the newspaper searching, newspaper searching is also quite easy to do it if you want to get into a quick and dirty version through what's called Google Media. So Google Media allows you to scrape it. The problem with Google Media, while we moved away from it, is it's not stable. So you do the same scrape the next day and you get a slightly different search response. But if you're not that bothered about it, so, yeah, I think news is a great way to do it, actually. It's harder for us to tell from these surveys. Thank you. Then pass it to Martin afterwards. Um, try to keep the question brief. Uh, you mentioned early on that uh, there's a bit of a cottage industry in producing, using different methodologies to come up with different measures of uncertainty. I'm just wondering what's being done on trying to aggregate or reconcile these different kinds of measures? Um, again, a great point. I mean, the... the I'd say the, the, main in, the main, just to go through them, the main measures generally are the financial ones, so stock market volatility, the realised and implied. Uh, then people look at GARCH types, so how volatile recent GDP growth has been. Then people also look at disagreement, so when you look at forecasters, how much they disagree. Uh, there's newspaper measures, uh, those are, and then sometimes surveys. There isn't much, there's surveys, it's hard to find long running trends. Of those four, typically when I've looked at them, the correlations, for example, in the US are like 0.5. So if you aggregate them up, you're probably, I mean, partly why we did this project is to try and find out what the, the problem is you don't know what the objective truth is. So what are you trying to maximize? Typically, people maximize their bit power to predict GDP growth rates in future or predict some future outcome uh, or explain contemporaneous GDP growth rates. On that basis, you know, VIX, so 
I, I, they're cross correlated. I suspect they're all picking up a similar underlying thing. I, in my mind, don't have one particularly good measure that's any better than the others, to be honest. So the bank, I know, has an amalgam. If I was going to generate one measure of uncertainty, I'd do the same thing. I'd just take the principal factor component of the four or five things that exist and go with that. I think that's you know, the most practical approach. But it's not perfect. It's why we're trying to do this, to try and find out whether any of them are more connected to what businesses think. <coughs> I was wondering what to make of the chart you plotted showing relationships between expectations and outturns and you know, the surprise, or at least to my mind, surprisingly good fit that you f found there. I wondered was wh whether this was because the correlation you're showing is being contaminated by fixed effects. You know, the firms in the fast-growing industry give a high number for growth and they get a high number for growth, but you know, there's the industry fixed effect on top of their own forecasting capability. Great, so we worried about, so what I can tell you from regression samples in much larger samples when you've looked at this, um, what you see is you can do a regression, you look at growth rate in year T and you regress it on the forecast I made last year plus the, the growth rate last year, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago of sales, the growth rate of employment two, three, four years ago, the growth investment rate two, three, four years ago, industry dummies, a whole bunch of other stuff. It still turns out the forecasts have like in the samples I've seen where you can do it in the US data, T-stats of like 30. So it is true that historic growth rates are strongly predicted. They're definitely a trend. So fixed effects are very much there. Yeah, but you can have T-stats of 30 without them being, say, rational. No, what you're controlling for is their lag sales growth rate. So we, yeah. see, their we see their historic growth rates. Um, now, if the, if they're, imagine their growth rate suddenly had a kink break. That's kind of what we're after, though. So if suddenly they're growing at 2% for many years, what we're after is trying to amalgamate up and get, for example, a good predictor of firms' growth rate, hence GDP looking ahead. And if a whole bunch of firms suddenly jumps upwards, we can't tell it from all the current indicators looking at historic growth rate. So that's what we're trying to get. So you're right that growth is persistent. So in our test to say with these forecasts are informative, we're going to control for everything we currently have, which is all the lag growth rates. But even after controlling for that, I, I put it another way, if you want to predict next year's growth rate, in the sense that any variable you want, the T-stat on the forecast is about 10x bigger than anything else. So it's incredibly informative. You can put in industry trends, whatever you like. It doesn't mean this other stuff doesn't matter. It definitely does. But the forecasts turn out to be kind of uncannily accurate. And what coefficient do you get on it, though? I mean, well, I can't clear, uh, you know, I, I can't at this point tell you. The, the, we can do the same thing in the ONS. It just takes time. Cause they, uh, just to remind the surveys, because they've only gone out recently, we've got to wait time for the realizations to come out, which is why we, I can't show numbers, because it hasn't gone through. Yeah, yeah. Have to be patient, Martin. So, last two. Oh, is it just Jonathan? Okay. Last one. So again, then, you, you, you really, really enjoyed the talk, really interesting. What, one angle which I don't know whether you can look at is, especially if you talk to lots of small firms about a source of uncertainty, they often have some kind of story about whether they're going to get paid or not. That is to say, they're at the end of some very long supply chain, you know, a major, they're doing business to business, <coughs> upstream, you know, a major, or downstream rather, a major fire goes bankrupt suddenly and they don't get right. paid. Is that, and of course, you can actually take insurance out against all of this. So, I mean, again, there may be issues as I don't know, I'm looking at Phil and Paul, I don't know if we, do we, we had some questions in the DMP on financial uncertainty and I can't remember, I totally agree, so it'd be a great, now I think about it, a really good question to ask actually, I don't know. So I think we haven't directly asked about the getting paid by Bangor, I don't think. We could, we could, we could definitely do that, it'd be a great idea actually. So, if anyone has any good suggestions on questions, you know. I mean, uh, maybe for small firms, it might be. No, no, I agree, definitely. Be. And it would, would vary over time. It would be a major source of uncertainty and downturns. I, I, I mean, we, the nice thing is you can put probabilities on it. You could say either, you know, probabilities will get paid in full or... Uh, the other thing is they get paid partly. I don't quite know how to construct the question because it feels like binary right now, but you could probably come up with something slightly more complete. You could ask the probability you get paid in full for every question, for every firm. That's a quick, easy question to ask, actually. It's just one number. Um, yeah, we should, we should ask that. Actually. Maybe in you know, two months' time. That would be a good thing to track. My suspicion is it is a material impact on firms. Actually. You're right. Nick, that was the last question. You're going to get lots more questions over lunch, but thank you very much. Thank you. So is everyone going to explain what's happening next?